Well, hello and welcome to the final day of our 21 days through the New Testament. It's Thursday the 16th of April, which happens to be my wife's birthday. And it is day 21 of the 21 days. Today we read the book of Revelation. And if you have continued with me these last 21 days and you've done all the reading, I want to congratulate you. And I know it's been a rewarding experience for you. It, it could be any, couldn't be anything but rewarding. So I'm excited about what we've done together. And I'm excited for those of you who may stumble onto these videos at some time in the future. And perhaps you've also gone through this series as a way to structure your Bible reading. So may the Lord bless you. So what did I notice today? Um, two things. First one, Revelation, which, I mean, let's be honest, the book of Revelation is... <laughs> It's an incredibly mysterious book. And uh, I mean, many people have tried to make sense of it. And I think you can get into wild speculation, which I'm going to try not to do. So here's what I did notice in Revelation 1 to 3. Uh, Jesus is addressing the seven churches around the world at the time of John. And in, the, in those words that he speaks to the churches, not one word is spoken about evangelism. You know, I noticed that not one word is addressed to the lost. Uh, Jesus is addressing his churches. And yes, he does speak to those perhaps who are not saved, who are within the churches. And he tells them to repent. But they are within the church somehow. Maybe they were born into the church or however they got there. But Jesus is supremely concerned with the state of his church. Now, for someone like me, much of, of, of my thinking, much of the stuff that I've, I've done with my life has been focused on reaching the lost, on addressing people who have never committed their lives to Jesus, trying to reason with them that it is insane not to do so. And yet, how much effort Jesus is putting into the existing church sorting out trouble within it, encouraging believers within it, correcting believers within the church. Um, and so it is good that we labor within the church in order to purify her. Then Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 and 4, we see incense being offered by an angel together with the prayers of the saints. Now that's interesting. Well, where does that come from? Well, on the, on the golden altar. So there's all this imagery of the Old Testament temple being used. There was this golden altar that sat just where the curtain was, where no one was allowed behind that curtain. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was in the presence of God. And only once a year was the high priest allowed in there and he had to take the blood of a lamb or the blood of a goat with him. And the blood would be put on the mercy seat and that would cleanse Israel for, for, uh, from her sins. But before he went in, he had to take a whole bunch of incense and put it on the fire on this, on this uh, golden altar. And then go in with the, this incense burning in like a, in a, um, one of those, uh, what are they called? I'm going to have to edit the video now because I'm, I'm thinking. Um, a, a, it's called a censer. And he would, they would go in with a censer with some of the coals from the altar and the incense on it. And it would fill the, the, the Holy of Holies, that inner room, with smoke. Why? So that when the high priest went, went in there, he wasn't seeing everything clearly so that he wouldn't um, he, he wouldn't be tempted to now like gaze on on the the presence of God or look inside the Ark of the Covenant. It was all smoky in there to 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 protect him from his own weaknesses when he went in. So so incense on on fire protects those entering the presence of God. It it makes their offering, which is imperfect, acceptable. Now think about that. Here in Revelation, we see incense being offered with the prayers of the saints. And here's my encouragement to you. Do not neglect to pray because you feel like you can't pray. Or when you pray, it's not acceptable to God. Or you don't know how to pray. You don't know what to say. Or you feel like your prayers are, maybe you're praying for the wrong things. Or, or, or you don't know the words to pray. Or Don't worry about that. God knows that you have weaknesses. He knows you don't know how to pray. 
Just pray. Just tell him what you want to tell him. Ask him what you want to ask him. Just be respectful in prayer and say what you what comes into your mind. And you know what? There is incense being offered with your prayers that that clouds over the weaknesses of them and makes your prayers acceptable to God. So just pray. Uh, What a great encouragement. Okay, as we close now, the 21 days, I want to I want to thank you again for coming on this journey with me. I want to bless you in the name of the Lord, you and your family. And I want to encourage you to take another step with me now. I have developed a course. It sits on the Barleyfield website called God Breathed and Profitable. It is a 10 session course on the scriptures themselves. And I want to encourage you now to go and enroll on that course. You've got one of two options. You can either go and enroll on it on the Barleyfield website. That's barleyfield.org. And you'll see we have five courses that we've developed that form part of a single strategy for local churches. One of the courses is this God Breathed and Profitable course. Go and register for it. It's it's free. Um, what is the format of the course? Well, we start in the first session talking about the history of, of the Bible, the history of the English Bible in particular, the fascinating story of William Tyndale. It's a great story. Then um, in the next couple of weeks, we talk about the claims the Bible makes about itself. What is the Bible? Well, the only way you know what the Bible is, is by seeing what it claims of itself. And we go through a series of staggering and dramatic claims the scriptures make about themselves. Um, We then head into two of the, the sessions on, can we trust the Bible? How do we know that the, that the Bible is what it claims of itself? And, um, When we go through those two sessions, you will actually be amazed by how historically verifiable, how the level of certainty we have that the Bible is actually what it claims to be. After that, we have a a session, one session on why we should read the Bible and what it will do for you. And that's an incredibly motivating topic. And then finally, uh, three sessions on how to read the Bible. Because, I mean, the Bible is a big book, you know, you pick up a Bible and it's like, you know, how do I start this thing? And the Old Testament is just like this mountain in my my mind. Like, how do I even go about it? Because a lot of Christians don't have an orderly approach to their Bible reading. And after those three sessions, I believe you will have a very clear understanding of how you should approach the Bible and how you should interpret it, how you should understand it so that you can get far more out of your approach to the Bible and your Bible reading. So please do go and register for that course. The other option that you have, instead of going to the Barleyfield website, which I think is better because there there is also a delicate manual with discussion questions or or, um, questions for you to think about after each of the sessions. But your other option is just to watch it on YouTube. So I've got a playlist. You should see a video up there now or in a second. If you click that video, it'll take you to the playlist on YouTube where all those 10 sessions are and you can do it there. Either way, please go and do the course. May God bless you in it. And if I don't get to meet you in this life, please make sure that I see you on the other side.